going on, even the pandemic, the virus, we are not sure. There are people who say it's just conspiracy, and there are people who say it's real. There are people who said it's orchestrated, and there are people who said, um, well, people are dying, we hear about what's happening in Cebu, so it should be real. So there are a lot of uncertainty today, even how to deal with this virus, how to protect ourselves, how to take precaution. There are so many questions in mind. People are questioning about the use of masks. People are questioning this and that. And so we are in this season of uncertainty. As much as we try to do everything to keep ourselves safe, we are never sure whether we're doing the right thing. That's the challenge that we are facing today. And in life, we also face a lot of questions and challenges. So this season of pandemic has added to the struggles that many people are facing. Those of us who are working, we're not sure how stable our job is. Those of us who are in business, we don't know how to, how to cope up for the two months wherein businesses were closed. So everyone is going through struggles. No one is exempted. However, in this season all the more, we want to rely on what God has in store for us. I was looking through the internet and I saw some pictures reminding us that something like this is not new. So this was um, in the early times, as you can see, it's black and white. This is a family um, who had their family picture and they were wearing masks. This is somebody who's standing um, outside a movie house and there's a note there that says, all theaters close until further notice as requested by the mayor. You know, during that, those times, you know, it's wonderful that the mayor can request the movie house to be closed and everybody comply. Today, you know, people, people will do rally because they want things their way. Uh, this is a lady who is uh, pushing a baby carriage and she's wearing a mask. Maybe she's wealthier, so she's wearing a more sophisticated mask. And um, two more ladies with, um, with their mask. And for those who are less fortunate or a little poorer, they can wear this. And so the same, the same instruction was given in the past. When in quarantine, well, actually, this is a New York telephone that says when in quarantine, people who are in quarantine are not isolated if they have a bell telephone. Well, today we're fortunate we have cell phone and we can still communicate with one another. But the same sign is there, whether it was 30, 40, 50 years ago or today, stay at home. It has been, never been um, easier to save lives. So, so the pandemic is not new. However, what is new is that everything is happening worldwide. Before, situations like this happen isolately, like in Europe or in parts of the United States. But because of the travel, it has become a worldwide thing. And so when you meet somebody along the way and you want to shake their hands and they did that, don't be offended. So today they have some suggestion how you can greet each other. You can greet each other with your elbows or with your feet. So that's way, some way of greetings. However, being Chinese, I am biased because the Chinese still maintain the best way of greeting each other, maintaining social distancing. Okay, so that's the situation of the world today. Things are changing rapidly and so fast. So much so that we don't know after this quarantine season and COVID season, will everything go back the way it is? Will everything be the same again? Even after um, July 15, we don't know what will happen. Will we go back to ECQ or will we continue with the modified or everything will be open? We don't know. But this is the statistic of the COVID as of yesterday, July 11. The global cases have reached 12.27 million with a total of 560,154 deaths. This is yesterday, I don't know about today. In USA, they have 3.18 million cases. Next to USA is Brazil, 1.8 million. Praise God, the Philippines is number 36 with 52,914. But let us not rejoice because number 36 doesn't mean necessarily few cases. It just means that many people have not been tested. 
So reported as of yesterday, additional uh, as of uh, Friday, additional cases of 1,160. And total debt is 1,360. So this is the statistic of the COVID um, thing. However, what is this season reminding us? Well, briefly, there are three things that this season is reminding us before I go to the Word. First, it is a season of introspection. It is a season in which we reflect what really matter in our life. We have been running after so many things. We have been busy with so many things. And it is in this season we realize everything that we are working hard for, everything that we are chasing and running after actually is insignificant, meaningless. We are, we are brought back to the book of Ecclesiastes where Solomon said, everything is meaningless. Everything is meaningless. That's why Solomon rightly ended Ecclesiastes by saying, remember your creator in the days of your youth. Ultimately, it is our relationship with God that matters, and it is our relationship also with the families that God has entrusted us that matter. So it is a season of rep retrospecting. No? No? God is good because in this season, as a pastor, I should worry about a lot of things. But there were two things I didn't worry about. I didn't worry about numbers. I didn't worry about finances. I don't know how the financial standing of the church is, honestly. I know that there are people because they are faithful, they have uh, deposited their tithes online, or some have started giving their tithes in the office once they knew that we have resumed going to office as staff of the church. But I prefer not to know the finances so that I can operate by faith, move by faith, and not by finances. But God is good because we have experienced His faithfulness. I know some of you, you're worried about finances. You don't know what's ahead you don't know what's going on you don't know how you're doing but we can always rely on the lord that he is faithful and this is a reminder to us because god reminded us that this is also a season of sifting god would like to sift through the believers you know we have raised a generation of christians who are so focused on themselves and on their feelings they like worshiping the lord if they feel good and it's easy for them to turn their backs on God when they don't feel okay. But God is sifting believers in this season. That's why I'm not worried about numbers. I'm excited because I know those who will remain will be those who are faithful. Because God, God is not up to numbers. God is after multitudes. Multitudes means people that God has identified people know by name. Churches today are playing numbers. They want more people. In fact, sometimes it's discouraging to hear what other churches and pastors are doing. I have a member who came to me, and she said she was invited by a pastor to her church. And this pastor is supposedly leading an inter-church movement. And so I asked her, maybe he doesn't know that you are a Christian. And she said, no, I told him I'm already a leader in my church. And he still invited me. Okay, I was thinking, I asked her another question. Maybe he didn't know you're from TCF. Because I'm thinking, you know, um, if, if pastors knew that uh, you're from TCF and, um, and they knew that I'm your pastor and we know each other, maybe, you know, mahuyat siya. But she said, no. I told, I told him I'm from TCF. And he still invited me three times. He said, testingi lang. So it's so sad these things are happening. You know, a few weeks ago, somebody came to TCF. He came to know Jesus Christ through TCF 15 years ago, and he moved to another church. And um, because of problem, he decided to come back because other than the church he was in, this is the church he felt that he came to know Christ. As a pastor, immediately I contacted the pastor where he came from, and we're scheduling to have coffee together with a pastor. You know, I believe that this is a generation wherein God would like to raise up Christians. It's easy for Christians just to move from one church to another. And more so in this online season where people can just tune in online. And sad to say, many people find it convenient to worship at home. They just worship at home. And they lose the joy of corporate worship. 
And aside from that, we're living in a generation where the Bible says people just want to hear what their itching ear would like to listen to. And so people can choose whoever preacher they want to listen to or whatever message they want to listen to. You know what I'm telling people even in church? I don't care if you listen to preachings and messages. Praise God, you do that more than Netflix. But even if you're listening to so many preaching and messages, but if you're not reading the Bible, it's not, it's not, it's just an, a, a false spirituality. You always go back to the Word of God. Go back to the Word of God. Because today, there are many preaching that you have to question, honestly. Because you don't know whether they are preparing the church for the end times or they are setting up the church so that believers can easily turn their backs on the Lord in times of difficulty and trial. I don't mean to judge or to criticize. However, this is the reality where we are living in. God wants to raise up a remnant of people whom He can use because He's confident that they are faithful and they will be the one that will bring in the harvest and the multitude into the kingdom of God. And that's why this is a season of preparation as well. Because God is preparing us for something great. A harvest is coming because the end is about to come. The Bible says before the end times, before the end comes, there will be great harvest that will happen in the church. Why? Because the gospel needs to be preached to the whole world and then the end will come. We're so focused on the signs, earthquakes, um, um, pestilences, um, volcanic eruption, uh, so on and so forth, wars. But we have forgotten that's, that these are just the beginning of the signs. The sign that Jesus said that will mark the end is when the gospel has been preached to the ends of the earth so that every person of every tribe has heard the message of the gospel and then the end will come. Now I'm beginning to see that all these events that the Bible talks about, the signs prior to the coming, are not isolated incident, but they are to prepare the world by the enemy for what the book of Revelation prophesied. One religion, one world government. You see today, if you look at the COVID, it's pandemic worldwide. And people are beginning to see that there is a need for coordination between countries. Because there is lack of coordination, the COVID has spread. But now the world is seeing there's a need to centralize everything. If there is one world government and there is coordination, it's easier to contain any pandemic. But secondly, if you notice, people today are so called cautious of physical contact. You know, when you buy things before, you just give the money, they get the money, they give you the change. Now you have to put it in the container. The world is being prepared for cashless society. And microchip is now being used. I read that in Sweden, many people have already implanted themselves with microchip. And all they have to do is just wave their hand. You know, right now we have Alexa. But in the future, you don't need Alexa anymore. You just need yourself. They use that right now in order to access their car. For the keyless car, you need a device attached to you and the car would detect that. But with a the microchip, they use that to open their cars. And, and more applications are being made for that, including health reasons. And so we are moving towards that. And that's why God would like to prepare the believers for this. We're preparing for the next series, Excess Baggage, in which we're talking about deadly sin. Last year, we talked about detestable sin. And um, next month, we'll start to talk about the seven deadly sin because we believe that um, many believers have taken for granted what the standard of God is. Today, we live in a generation where people have been taught God is good, God is gracious, God is love. Even if you continue to sin, God will continue to forgive you. And some have em embraced the teaching that you don't even have to confess your sins anymore because God has forgiven you past, present, and future. 
And so therefore, if you sin, just go to God. Ask forgiveness. And if you sin again, so on, just do it again. But we have lost the sense that God is a holy God and God has a standard for every, every person, especially His children. Because the Word of God said, judgment begins in the house of God. And so today, I would like to talk a little something that would hopefully be more encouraging and more comforting. And that is God being our shepherd. And um, as we look at Psalms 23, can we all stand as we read it together? Um, I see some of you bringing Bible. I appreciate that. I know that um, today is very convenient because we have it in our gadget. But can you think that, can you even begin to think that one day, what if the Bible will be banned from all apps? You know, in California today, they are not allowed to sing worship songs when they go to church because it will spread COVID virus. And so they only come to church, the pastor preach, that's it. They are not allowed to sing worship songs. What if that time comes? Are we ready for that? And so Psalms 23, let us, let us read it together because we have different versions. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Okay, you may be seated. I would like to start by looking at the, the, the word, the Lord. The word the Lord there is from Hebrew, which is transliterated YHWH. As we know, when the Jewish people come across this name of God, they don't read it because they consider it very sacred. And so they replace this, this word with Elohim, which talks about God, who, uh, the generic, generic name of God. And so that's why today there are two variations in which this name is read. Because there is no vowels. So therefore, the Jewish people, when they read the scripture, they read it half memorized. Have you ever read a book, read a book without vowels? All you see is consonant. Can you read that? No, you can read that if you have half memorized the book. And so that's why that the Jewish parents would read the scripture every day to their children until they, they somehow master the Bible so that they can read that. And so there are two variations in which this name is read. If you put the vowel A and E, you read it, you read it as Yahweh. If you put the vowels E-O-A, you read it as Yehoah or Jehovah as we know it. So both are the same. And where did this name come from? It was a name given by God to Moses. When Moses asked, If I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? For a moment, if you're Moses, and um, God told you, Go to the Israelites and tell them my message. And you go to the Israelites, and they ask you, Who is this God who sent you? That's why Moses was asking, what is your name? So that if they ask, I can tell them. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelite, I am has sent you. So if the people of Israel ask Moses, who sent you? Moses will say, I am sent me. It's not easy. For people, it might not make sense. But you know, this name is the most powerful name of God because it talks about who God is and it reminds us that we can never totally understand and comprehend God because He is who He is. So Yahweh or Jehovah means the one who is and the one who causes. The one who is and the one who causes things to happen. This name is so powerful that it became a compound name for many other names that God has revealed in the Bible. 
Like for example, we have Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. Jehovah Rash, the Lord is my shepherd. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. Jehovah Shema, the Lord is there. Jehovah Tzidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah Medoshikan, the Lord who sanctifies you. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace. Jehovah Shabbat, the Lord of hosts. How does these names apply to us? Well, we're reminded that since the Lord is our banner, I am the one who raised you. The Lord is your shepherd. He's the one who cares for you. The Lord is your healer. He's the one who preserves you. The Lord is with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. The Lord is your righteousness. He gave his life for you. The Lord is your sanctifier. He cleansed you from your sins. The Lord is your provider. He will supply all your need. The Lord is your peace. He will make your life complete. The Lord is the Lord of hosts, and He has won the victory for you. That's who God is. He is everything you need Him to be. That's why Psalms 23 verse 1 said, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You know, talking about shepherd, we are reminded of sheep. The Bible says we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Most people think of sheep as dumb, stupid animals. So sheep have a reputation of being stupid, defenseless, and harmless. They mope about on hillsides, doing not very much. They are good for two things, being eaten and producing wool. But the reality is sheep are exactly surprisingly intelligent with impressive memory and recognition skills. They build friendships, stick up for one another in fights, and feel sad when their friends are sent to slaughter. In 2001, a study by Kate Kendrick, this is featured in BBC, he found that sheep can recognize and remember at least 50 individual faces for more than two years. This is probably more than many of us can remember. And that's why the Bible says, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my, my life for my sheep, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them in also. They too will listen to my voice and they shall be one flock and one shepherd. If you go to YouTube, you can find video about sheep. People are trying to test the recognition, voice recognition of the sheep. And you'll be surprised that the sheep only respond to their shepherd. And so there are six struggles I would like to talk briefly today and why it is important for us to remember that Jesus or God is our shepherd. First struggle is satisfaction. The problem is what thrills me today bores me tomorrow. It's exciting if you get something new. A new shoes, a new gadget, a new thing. You know, you don't want to part with it. You, before you go to sleep, you hold it. And when you wake up in the morning, you look for it until after a while when it bores you. And so you start to look for something else that would bring satisfaction to you. Especially in our generation today, satisfaction is very difficult because there's so many things that, that, that struggles with our attention. And that's why when something already bore you, you try to look for something that is more exciting than before. And the challenge of losing, of, of finding something that is more exciting becomes difficult. And that's why this, this is a generation of endless struggle for satisfaction. But we are reminded by what the Bible says, God is my provider. I like what one translation said, the Lord is my shepherd, I don't need anything can you tell the person beside you i don't need anything verse 2 tells us he makes me lie down in green pastures talking about pastures we are reminded that a pasture has a fence the fence is meant to protect the sheep you know many times the walls in our homes are meant to keep the thieves from coming in but if you go to, third, to first world country, you're going to notice that they don't have walls, they have fence. And fence are very low, waist high. 
So if you intend for the fans to keep the thieves from coming in, you know, kundi rin sa Pilipinas, no? kataas na, makasulod pang kawatan, how much more a fence? The fence is meant to keep people from going out, especially the little children who are playing in the front yard or the backyard. And because the Lord is our shepherd, He protects us. We are covered by fence in order to protect us, to keep us from moving out into destruction. Many times people complain, how come their God has so many commandments that says, Thou shall not? Because we are people who easily forget. That's why God has to put fence like the commandment to remind us that if you cross the line, you are bringing your own life into destruction. Second, it allows us perspective to see. You know, during this COVID season, people like to go to mountain. How many, how many of you have been to mountain? You know, the past two weeks, I've gone to Don Salvador and, uh, and Lantawan five times. You know, we like to go to mountains because we can see a beautiful view. You know, it reminds us that God would like to give us a different perspective, a different view of life than what we are used to. And that's why He makes us lie down in green pastures so that we can set aside our worries and anxieties. And third, usually the Lord leads us through path that we need to follow. And therefore, pastures have path in which the shepherd lead the sheep. That's why second struggle we, we, we have is restlessness, restedness. People struggle today with busyness. The Bible says, He leads me beside quiet waters and refreshes my soul. And He guides me along the right path for His name's sake. There are three rests that we need today. First, we need the rest for our body. And that's why the Bible says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. God's solution to lack of rest is to slow down. And this COVID season caused us to slow down whether we like it or not. It caused us to stay at home and to, and to find other productive things that we can do. And so some people have learned to cook. You know, I've started cooking again because uh, there, I have time. But at the same time, I started to do things that I didn't do before. So we did a lot of uh, recording and taping because we, we try to minister to people who cannot come to church. And so we become creative. We start to think outside the box. So slowing down actually causes us to listen to the Lord. Slowing down causes us to receive instruction from the Lord. And slowing down causes us to think how we can serve God more. Second is the rest for the mind. He leads me beside still water. You know, when you are beside the still water, it's so calming. That's why for some people who are used to going to spa, you notice that usually the music, background music is still water, you know, a river flowing peacefully. See, we, we are so worried with so many things. We think of so many things. People today are overthinking. Wala pa problema, may problema na. And that's why we need rest for the mind. And God's solution is for us to seek and submit to His will. Do you know that being Christian is, if you really want to live the Christian life, it's so simple. Why? You don't have to. You don't have to plan. You just receive God's plan. You know, many times, we plan ourselves and we ask God, not for His plan, but to bless our plan. But the secret to the, Christ, to the Christian life is so simple yet so difficult. Surrender. When we learn to surrender to the Lord, we don't need to drive the car. We just sit on the driver's side and enjoy the ride. Now, sometimes I like to drive because I, I get sleepy when I'm riding. But then, sometimes I enjoy just sitting down and not driving and enjoy the view. So most of the times, we, allow, we need to allow God to just take the driver's seat and just surrender ourselves to Him. Third, rest for the soul. He restores my soul. We are, we are cluttered in our life with so many struggles and problems, so many discouragement and frustration, so many hurts and pains that we need to declutter our soul. 
we need to release ourselves from these baggages of life. And that's why God's solution is to receive healing from Him. We cannot serve God effectively. We cannot be effective Christians if we still carry so much hurts inside us. Now, John Maxwell have a famous line, hurting people hurt people. And if we are not careful, our hurts will cause us to hurt people unintentionally and unconsciously. That's why we need to constantly receive healing. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 11, 28 to 29, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Jesus is not saying, you bring your, you bring your burden to me, then you will be free from burden. No, Jesus is not saying that. Jesus is saying, you bring your burden to me, I will replace it with a lighter burden. And you can be sure why the burden is lighter, because I will carry it with you. Struggle number three is significance. In life, we need a guide to lead us to a significant life. The Bible says he paths for his name's sake. You know, in Proverbs 14, verse 12, the Bible reminds us there's a way that seems right to men, but in the end, it leads to death. And in Isaiah 53, verse 6, we have strayed like sheep and have left God's path to follow our own. And that's why we're reminded that we are in a journey seeking significance in life. And we think significance has to do with more money and more recognition or more titles. Now, pastor was telling me that um, he went to apply for a marriage license and the one who received his application was telling him, no, I cannot understand many of the pastors. How come they like to put so many titles in their name? You see, we are living in a generation where titles have become important to us. So it's not enough to a PhD or this and that. And that's why there was a joke. My PhD na, my DVD pa. Because people want titles in their name. Because that's how they see significance. But in this COVID season, you remove your position, you remove your title. You were quarantined at home. It made you realize that all this actually are nothing. I was supposed to take up my um, PhD in counseling this June, but because of the quarantine and the COVID, um, it was postponed. So, so it made me realize, Lord, if it's not your time, okay. If it's time, okay. I don't worry. I don't bother myself with that. God has his right time. Because I want to learn, and I'm not after the title anyway. So anytime, Lord, when it's time. So we have to remember, it's not about these things, because these things will not bring significance into our lives. But rather, we are reminded that it is God, when we follow Him, He brings value into who we are. I like James 1, 5 to 6 in the Living Bible Translation because it says, if you want to know what God really wants you to do, ask Him. Direct to the point, no? And He will gladly tell you, for He is always ready to give an abundant supply of wisdom to all who ask Him. But, be sure that you really expect Him to tell you. <laughs> because if you don't ask in faith, don't expect the Lord to give you any solid answer. When you ask God for guidance, be ready to listen to Him. And the Bible says, ask Him by faith. Ask in faith. What does it mean to ask in faith? It means when you ask God for something, you have faith in Him that, what, that the answer that He gave you is the best answer. That God's plan is good, pleasing, and perfect. Anything less than the plan of God is not the best. And that's why the Bible says, He guides me along the right path for His name's sake, for Him. And if God is doing for His name's sake, that means His reputation is on the line, then you can be assured that He is going to do it the perfect way. Struggle number four, fear and worry. The Bible says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. 
your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It's very interesting. Whenever you think about the rod and the staff, you think about discipline. You know, the rod, we talk about the rod of discipline. You know, the rod is a shorter stick that the shepherd uses. And it's also a deadly weapon. The, the shepherd can use the weapon because it is taken from the root of a tree. And it has a, some sort of a club at the end. So, if the, if the shepherd cannot drive the wolves and the predator away or use the sling, the last resort is to use the club and throw it. So the shepherd can use, do it with precision. It can strike the, the, the wolves or the predator and cause great injury. But at the same time, the, the staff that the shepherd used is, 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 is needed in order to bring the lost sheep back. Or if the sheep fell off the cliff, the shepherd can use it as a hook to pull the sheep back. So this too talks about discipline and correction. It's very interesting that the Bible says, what is meant for discipline brings comfort to us. Have you ever associated discipline with comfort? Praise God, I'm being disciplined today. It's very comforting. We never associate that. You know, in school, when a student said, you go to the dis discipline office, will they feel comforted? No. But when we understand what discipline truly is, then we know it really brings comfort to you. The word discipline actually comes from the Latin word discipulus, which we also derive the word disciple. So a disciple of Jesus Christ is one who is under discipline. Okay? So, Discipulus talks about a pupil or a learner, someone who continues to learn. And we can never learn if we don't discipline ourselves. And that's why the Bible says in Job chapter 5, 17, from somebody who has gone through so much pain and difficulties in life, Job, blessed is the one whom God corrects. And in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, the Bible says, No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Look at what the Bible says. It produces a harvest of righteousness for those who have been trained, for those whom God is preparing to use in a very powerful way. And so talking about fear and worry, we are reminded of four things. First, recognize valleys as path to higher ground. Sometimes we think when we are in valley or in the wilderness, everything seems hopeless. Last week I shared to the church, the greater the hopelessness, the sweeter the victory. God is in control. And when we are in valleys, He is preparing us for higher ground. Second, refuse to be intimidated. I will fear no evil. Third, remember that God is with you. You are with me. According to Max Lucado, loneliness is not the absence of faces. It is the absence of intimacy. For a Christian to feel lonely, it means probably we have not learned to be intimate with Christ. This coffee season has caused me to reflect and evaluate how we do discipleship. There are two things that I realized. Number one, that our goal as disciples is to help our disciple become independent from us. You know, there are disciples who feel good when there are people who need them. And they feed their ego on the needs of others. But, but a, a successful disciple is somebody who helps their disciple become independent from them and dependent on the Lord. So our goal is not to lead people to us, or to lead people, but to lead them to Jesus Christ. And second, discipleship is not just modeling what people are doing, but discipleship is learning the character and the attitude and the heart of people. Because today, people want to follow. We follow the trend. We follow our disciples, what our disciples are doing. But many times I realize people may do what they see others are doing, but they may not have learned doing it from their heart. And so that's why 
the main goal is always intimacy with God. We have to help people become intimate with the Lord. Many people today are lonely. They have a lot of friends, but their friends are viral or, or, or virtual or online. They have, you know, you look at your Facebook, you have hundreds of friends. But how many real friends do we truly have? Number four, rely on God's strength and guidance. Always think of God's rod and stuff as a blessing and a comfort because it keeps you from going the wrong way. Struggle number five, failure. The Bible says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies and you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Let me ask you a question. Who do you allow yourselves to define your success or failures? Who do you allow to define your failures or success? And usually the answer is others. People define our failures and success. So when we fail on something, we think of ourselves as a failure. But failure is not the person, but the thing that has been done. You may fail in what you did, but it doesn't mean you are a failure. You become a failure when you dwell on your failure. But when you rise up and begin to do things again, you are not a failure. You know, the Bible says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. What's the point of anointing the head of sheep with oil? First, it repels insects. When the anointing of God is upon our lives, you know, we have power to overcome the evil one. The Bible says the power is not us, but God in us. That's why the Bible reminds us, if you want Satan to run away from you, what do you do? Draw near to God and resist him, and he will flee from you. And so if we have the anointing of God, if we are the presence of God, then we can overcome temptations. Second, it prevents conflict from happening. You know, when sheep are covered with oil, and sometimes they quarrel, especially during mating season, because one sheep says, I like you, and the other one says, uh, she's mine, and so they fight. You know, having oil um, keeps serious injury from happening, because as they hit each other, um, the oil caused them to slide from one another. But there's a third. Oil also heals wound. And so, that's why in our life, we have so many wounds because of our failures. And many times, people add to the wound and the injury that we face. You know, have you ever experienced that somebody speak things that are not true against you? What is your response? You know, if we are honest, the human response is to defend ourselves, to speak back. No, but the Bible reminds us, God said, vengeance is mine, declares the Lord. You know, when we take vengeance into our own hand, we rob God of His work. But when we surrender it to the Lord, God does something else. He vindicates us. When you take vengeance on your own, you may feel good for a while, but in the end, it makes you, it make you come out even worse than before. When you allow God to vindicate you, He clears your name. So there's a big difference between vengeance and vindication. And that's why the Bible says, God, anoint, God anoints me with oil in the presence of mine enemies. If there are people who have put you down, criticized you, hurt you, or whatever, surrender to the Lord. Because the Bible says, when vindication comes, God will vindicate you in front of your enemies. And finally, number six, the future. Question, is it okay to have the best of both world? 
Okay? Without looking at each other, just me looking at you because I'm just curious, how many of you says it's not okay? It's not okay to have the best of both worlds. Can I see your hand? Okay, thank you for your honest answer. How many of you says it's okay to have the best of both worlds? Can I see your hand? Okay, half, half. And majority have not raised their hand. <laughs> Okay, I know this is a tricky question because probably for some of you, what comes to your mind is not love the world or anything in it. You cannot love God and love the world at the same time. But let me explain, okay, that um, it is God's desire for us to have abundant life. Jesus said, I come that you may have life and have it to the fullest, meaning abundant, significant life. Okay. People are saying he's talking about the future, eternal life, but it's not. Okay, because Jesus said, I come to this world that you may have life in this world and have it more abundantly. And also in the same verse prior to that, Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. We know that there's no thief in eternity. So therefore, Jesus need not say, you will have abundant life in eternity. The thief comes to this world to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come to this world that you may have life in this world abundantly. And so it is God's desire, first of all, that we have significant and abundant life, but not in the way that people today think. More money, prosperity, more wealth. That's why the problem today is many Christians easily fall back away from God. You know, the, the Bible says in the last days, many will turn away from their faith. Why? Because the world is being conditioned today. If you become a Christian, you will be prosperous. You will be blessed. And so if these things doesn't happen, good sila kay God. They get upset with God and turn their backs on God. In verse 6, the Bible says, Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The word is surely. Surely. We have been talking about pastures. One of the mindset in the world today is to run after greener pastures. And that's why people go where the greener pasture is or where the greenbacks are. But right now, the greenbacks uh, have depreciated. And so we have people in church working online. They really feel the difference. When the dollars were good and now that the dollars is lower you know, people run after greener pastures and many times these opportunities that come into our life may not be god's plan for us you know not everything that is good is of god not everything that is good is of god there are times that something good is meant to distract us from where the lord wants us to be but look at what the Bible says. You don't have to run after opportunities. Because God's goodness and love will run after you. Surely, God's goodness and love will follow you all the days of your life. And the Bible says, and you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is what David is declaring. While I am here on earth, I will experience the best of this world. I will live abundantly. I will live significantly. And when my life in this world is over, I will enjoy eternity in the presence of God. And this is very much expressed in Psalms 84 verse 10 when David said, Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. And also in Psalms 24, verse 7, One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and seek Him in His temple. The problem with Christianity today is Christians want the good life in this world and want the new heavens and the new earth. They have forgotten that what linked you to your life today and to your life to come is God. If you miss on the fact that God is the one who satisfies you, that because God is in your life, therefore you shall not want, then you are missing on what being a Christian is. 
Hadon Robinson said, David was not thinking precisely where he would be in the future, but with whom he will be. What gets you excited when you think about Jesus coming back in eternity? The streets of gold, the pearly gates, the beautiful city, or the fact that you will see God face to face. Is being a Christian an escape for us so that we won't go to hell? Or is being a Christian a joy and excitement because we know we will see God one day? Let's pray. Lord, as we come before your presence, O God, we thank you for reminding us that you are our shepherd. And being our shepherd, O God, we can truly declare that we don't lack anything. You know everything that we need. You supply in abundance everything that we need. You are Yahweh. You are Jehovah. You are whom you said you are. And may we always remember who you are so that we can live our lives for you. May your name be glorified through us as we live through Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take a few minutes to reflect on the questions. What has the Lord been revealing to you during this season? What has been the basis of your success and source of joy? And how does knowing God as your shepherd help you through the crisis of life?